Hi everyone, I'm Jeff Way, the Manager of Publishing Future for the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. Now entering its fourth year, the ACMRS Short-Term Residency Program is designed to provide flexible support for pre-modern scholars working on research for publication. Part of the residency includes a presentation of the work in progress, and we're very excited that the residents for 2021-2022 have decided to do this presentation in the form of a dialogue that you can all watch here. In this conversation, Sawyer Kemp and Cameron Hunt McNabb discuss issues around disability and access in modern Shakespearean performance. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. Um, I'm so excited. I think it's kind of a happy accident that our projects have so much overlap. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty excited to chat with you since I'm working on a project about access construed really broadly across Shakespeare theaters. And I think we can kind of tease out some of the scale hopping between what that means for disability specifically and what it means in all of the wacky ways that Shakespeareans tend to use the word access. Um, yeah, and I'm just excited to be here too because um, I was really excited when I saw that your work deals with um, access more broadly and then mine is just really invested in disability in the theater and that you're coming from, in part, kind of a practitioner's background, too. So I think that's awesome. Yeah, I think we have a lot a lot of overlap here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So let's dive in. OK, so <laughs> I have I have a, a question for you, Okay. which is I, I wanted you to talk about um, some of the known challenges with access and Shakespearean theater specifically. Sure, which is a great question. And I think I started on this project because when Shakespeare theaters say they're making something accessible, they mean something totally different than anyone else <laughs> means when they talk about access. And I think even within the even within the world of nonprofits where access has this rhetoric cash already, um, I think Shakespeareans are invested in doing something to Shakespeare to cultivate new audiences. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really touching on a lot of different spheres. So in, in my book, I look at this through what I call four types. And the first of them, obviously, is disability accommodation and physical navigability of the space. Um, but it also tends to mean things like connecting with audiences through social media or through these kind of immersive outreach projects. It means building certain types of what I, I call legibility, but it's any type of intellectual or education effort like podcasts or lectures, uh, anything that they put in the program material that's sort of bonus info to help people understand the play. Right. Um, and then also, lastly, a category that I think expands as wide as we can fill it. Um, but I, I call it relatability. But what it really is, is creating emotional stakes, which are really frequently political stakes um, of, of ways to map the productions um, or engage with community partners on certain productions in order to address um, issues of elitism in the theater, um, issues of different minorities, especially racial minority groups that are typically not seen in these productions, um, any type of Ad address to economic disparity, which I think has a lot of overlap with disability. So I'm just curious about also what you see as the kind of known known challenges and, and problems. Yeah, your um, your word relatability like really helped me kind of just put a finger on some of what I had been seeing in the theater, but like that term is just really helpful. So like in particular, I was when you were talking about that, it made me think of. Um, some like recent productions at Shakespeare in the Park, which mm -hmm. has <clears throat> tried to do all of those things that you're talking about, but they did a uh, production of Julius Caesar and cast Caesar as Trump, which made it, I think, relatable, but also added some of that legibility in terms of uh, like translating it to a contemporary setting. Um, so anyway, that was just, that was really helpful to me. Um, and I continue, when I think about access and particularly the Shakespearean theater, um, I do tend to come more from that kind of physical accommodations or just right. disability angle. And so I think that we already have social scripts around the theater mm -hmm. that prescribe silence and stillness. And then if you add that this is a Shakespearean play, there tends to be this like amping up of those social scripts. Which is in no way based on any kind of historical reality. Exactly. Yeah. I was like, Shakespeare's audiences were not silent and they were not still. Um, and so, but I, yeah, it feels kind of like amplified. This has to, this has to happen. And 
So those social scripts just exclude right, so many demographics of, of people, um, and, and in particular in the disability community. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I think that kind of maybe shifts us into our second question yeah. area too pretty nicely, which are, um, I want to make sure that I, I read it specifically, <laughs> uh, but we were interested in what are the divisions in different disciplines around labor and methodology and sort of practitioner versus scholarly orientations and theory that make it difficult to institute this type of access. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like um, both scholar or scholars and practitioners have just kind of different orientations towards the text. Mm -hmm. And so scholars tend to be um, they privilege the text and are are uh, not as kind of malleable when it comes to what the text might be saying. Whereas I feel like practitioners are a little more open maybe to the multivalency of the text and its potentials and its variability. Um, that dichotomy is a little reductive, but I sure. still think that kind of in broad strokes it holds true with the ways that scholars are trained versus the ways that um, practitioners are trained, um, but I also feel like there's just a broader kind of relationship where academia quietly says, right, that the less accessible something is, the more valuable it is. Mm -hmm. And even as we have a lot of projects on public humanities and open access and making these materials legible and relatable, yeah. even as all of that happens, I think there's still a lot of spoken and unspoken structures that kind of say um, that that is not on par with traditional publishing or traditional modes of scholarship. I noticed this a lot in, in my research too, that the, the attempt to make something accessible often intersects with adaptation in ways that make everyone, both practitioners and scholars, <laughs> very uncomfortable, right? Yeah. And so there's this there's this tension, I think, between theaters and, and also scholars who have a real, I think, earnest and genuine desire to see uh, the work reach and connect with new audiences and people who believe, um, you know, in their scholarly research that this is indeed something that applies to, um, you know, whatever your kind of particular orientation to the text is, um, that, that it does have meaning, but also a real resistance to changing the way that the structures operate. And, you know, I think from a theatrical perspective, sometimes I think theater practitioners would say that's because scholars lack a kind of practical and applied and <laughs> budgetary um, yeah. reality yeah. <laughs> to the idea of like, well, we have to put this show up in four weeks and, right. and on March 10th, it's opening, whether it's, you know, cohesive and legible or not. Um, but I, I think the other, the other thing that, that you were making me think of with the divisions between both scholars and, and practitioners, but also sometimes what I notice is within the same theater continuity across messaging from what is kind of advertising, targeting audiences versus what the actual play does. And I find that, and I, again, we're being, we're talking in broad strokes. So a lot of this, uh, yeah. you know, is probably case by case, but I find that front of house is much better trained and versed in interacting with disability and creating accommodations, especially on the spot, because they're the people who are actually interacting with yeah. patrons all day. <laughs> um, and that often those are also the people who are required to attend certain diversity trainings, whereas maybe not everyone in the theater is actually getting that information. Um, and I think, I think there is an assumption that that work is customer service oriented, but it actually can inform the way that we're making the art um, in really significant ways. Yeah, it seems like, you know, we have all of these different groups that are often working in kind of silos of knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and then we, a lot of that different types of knowledge that gets lost, whether it's disability knowledge coming from um, front of house, kind of on the ground, um, or uh, in in the scholarship, right? Like the knowledge of like, like here's what it takes to actually put a show on and right. then, like what, what you have to well, do. How many of our sort of listen, uh, assisted listening devices are broken today? Yeah. Right, is, an, is a real major question that's yeah. going to impact the way, 
you know, however many that is, 13, 12, six people yes. see that show. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and the other thing that I, I kind of wanted to tack on here to that, that I think we've talked about a little bit before um, is the idea of revisiting tropes that get built into a theatrical practice or a kind of a scholarly lens um, yeah. that we get accustomed to seeing. Uh, and, and I find that there is some overlap here with the, the tropes that I see so frequently are kind of the man in dress gag and um, person on crutches falls down, right? And that yeah. we have these kind of tropes of comedy that we get comfortable with over time and that are really easy fixes but just keep kind of creeping in. Yeah. Um, yeah. And even like easy, like you're, you're talking about easy fixes too. It was making me think about like, I know we're going to talk about some of the things that like theater could do differently mm -hmm. or whatever, but that um, sometimes and there's a, the, the fix or at least the step is something as simple as let's just do one performance. That's a relaxed performance, mm -hmm. you know, one performance that, the ticket price is lower and there then a noise and movement and all are acceptable. And so like a lot of times these might be really big issues, but that there are very small steps that we can make that they, that can do a lot. Yeah. Right. And, and also kind of experimental attempts and just yeah. seeing, I think it's okay to be in a space of throwing things at the wall and seeing what works and getting feedback from people and not assuming that you can fix the problem without those people being part of the conversation. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that actually like leads right into our third question, so that's great. But um, uh, especially coming from your own background in the theater, like what are what are some things that you see that the theater could do differently to increase access or or um, do access better? Sure. Well, and I think that as I said, I think a lot, thinking broad in broad strokes about access and in these kind of different pockets, there is usually a concerted effort of people who are who are trying to make things happen. Um, and what I'm, what I kind of try to stress in the book is to try to find that continuity across departments and to try to have an, a kind of holistic, I call it holistic dramaturgy, where the message of the play is going to interact with the messaging that your audience is receiving, as well as the way your actors are, are being treated and, and, and kind of all of a piece. Yeah. Um, the way you do anything is the way you do everything is, is mm -hmm. part of that. But I think also in terms of disability specifically, um, obviously thinking about hiring disabled actors um, and having them in, that is, I think, step one. Yeah. Um, but I, I think also, as we, as we spoke about, uh, hiring disabled actors, not just to do disabled roles right. um, and to kind of expand the types of meaning that bodies are allowed to convey. Um, I think hiring and retaining diverse staff is really important. And I think retaining is the key there, right? Mm -hmm. Not just hiring as a token gesture, but having a structure in place to understand why they weren't already part of your organization. Um, and a willingness to change. Uh, and I understand that a lot of this, a lot of this is budgetary, right? You can't rebuild your whole theater in a day. Um, but you know, I, I was working on a play where I had an actor who was a wheelchair user and um, we had rented this venue that assured us they were ADA compliant and they were not. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was literally in, I was the director, but I was literally in the bathroom installing a grab bar, right? Yeah. Like they needed that. Um, and that was something that had to be done. But the, the other thing I think is the other parts of that are not so, not so uh, hardware oriented are things like, Thinking about the way that the rehearsal schedule um, may be, that what we think of as typical for a theatrical production may actually be part of what is preventing those actors from participating in the work. Um, and to try to change what we think of as customary and if that might mean making the rehearsal schedule longer, that might be, that was one thing I learned was that in the future, I think I would make that schedule a little bit more flexible and longer um, to accommodate for things like chronic illness. Yeah. So the your your comment too about like kind of different types of knowledge is really I think some of what I focus on of this project too, which is like trying, at least in the theater space, like moving beyond certainly moving beyond tokenism, but mm -hmm. even moving beyond an idea of just representation. Yes. But that what someone's doing is they're bringing a particular knowledge base and whether that's disability knowledge or kind of gendered knowledge or whatever, 
but that they're bringing this knowledge in. And when we're in our silos, if you don't, we're often lacking that. Um, and so thinking about something that theaters can do can just be as, as uh, straightforward as like, how much knowledge are you bringing in in front of house and mm -hmm. back of house and actors and, and everybody involved, directors and whoever, um, and just increasing that knowledge base so that your representations of these characters or how your physical theater space is set up yeah. or whatever. You and know. so that people don't have to be their own advocates, yeah. right? And so that yeah. there's a general um, level of knowledge that the environment has right. at a base level. Yeah. That is yeah. And something else I see in like your your story illustrates how a theater could say, oh, yes, we're ADA compliant and then are not. Right. Um, but that something I see both in uh, physical theater spaces, but even inside the classroom is that ADA sometimes serves as like a like a check mark. Like, oh, we did that. So we're accessible. And it's like, mm, no, yeah. <laughs> you know, so even even when it is meeting those standards. I think that in so many ways, those standards are subpar yes. for being equitable and inclusive. They're yeah. a bare minimum. Yeah, sure. a very bare minimum. Um, I think that that also leads us into kind of the second half of this question, which is what the, what can scholars uh, do differently to create access? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think about this a lot um, because, and what scholars may be, what I'd like to see them doing differently. <laughs> so I think one of the big things is is ways of reading, and I, I advocate for this in, in some of my work, that um, scholars are very trained, I think, to read text in particular ways, but to envision characters in particular ways. And I actually use that vision word because I think that we're really ocular centric mm -hmm. and so we create static kind of portraits yeah. of how we read so maybe we read and we envision Oedipus or Othello and we are seeing them like in our mind's eye in a way that is a particular gender or a particular race but that disability is often not legible in those ways and instead I would suggest that like ways of reading involve thinking about a character and instead of saying what do they look like think about how do they move how do they talk mm -hmm. how do they think how do they feel and so getting um kind of rounder and richer characterizations um that are less static i think brings disability to the forefront in ways that our kind of current conditioning doesn't yeah yeah i think that the idea of pushing and I, I think maybe this also goes back to our, our earlier discussion about methodology a little bit, too, um, pushing scholars to think about rendering the argument that they're making visually is a really is a, a really helpful move when thinking about people mm -hmm. as not just as these uh, act, the characters as people and not just as kind of static um, declamatory poses, really. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so like my my other thought on that is about how can scholars bring performance into the classroom? Mm -hmm. um, because again, most scholars aren't trained in acting or, and they may not have a lot of experience in the theater, but you can bring performance kind of oriented assignments and um, just projects into the classroom. Mm -hmm. So considering alternatives to just a written paper and having students either perform a scene or I, I know we were talking about an assignment I do where I hire actors to come in and students direct them. And so students don't have to have any kind of training in acting, yeah. um, but they get a really good sense of, okay, here are the pragmatics of space and time and bodies on a stage to, to put a scene on. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the uh, one flaw with the assignment that I think we, we tend to give, which is just do this scene. Yeah. Right, with, um, <laughs> none of the props or skills or training that would make that um, something that you knew how to do. Right. Um, I think that the more we can frame those as specific questions about, um, you know, here are three readings of Falstaff and what are the different um, ways that you would convey those meanings in this scene through either edits to the script or a movement around the stage. Um, or getting students to kind of play with lighting is something that I find kind of rewarding. Yeah. Um, not just for disability, but for thinking about these texts in performance and the way that 
they truly are adaptable. Like they, I think that's why I enjoy working on drama texts, right? Is that they are going to be a different thing every time you see them. And I think once students grasp that, uh, then they can kind of start to reimagine how performance is itself making a kind of argument about the text right. every time. Yeah. Yeah. And my background in medieval drama, um, like the uh, Kalamazoo every year, which is our kind of major conference, mm -hmm. um, the, the medieval drama people <laughs> have a festival of drama and they bring some, most of the time it's students, um, but even sometimes it's just uh, the, the scholars and they put on some of these plays and they are not professionals, you know, mm -hmm. the, a lot of them don't have at least a strong background in acting, and some of them do, certainly, sure. um, but it just shows how uh, accessible I think that theater can be, and it, it puts on these performances so that scholars who are coming are able to have access to come and see these performances, so I would love to see more of that stuff happening, I think, more broadly in, in scholarship in general, yeah. Yeah, I think this this isn't this. The other thought that I had about scholarship, which is not necessarily about performance, um, and is more kind of circling back around to 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 disability, is the caution, I guess, to say that uh, there is very little transferability um, mm -hmm. between different types of access. And something yeah. that I, I notice in in kind of theater institutions is that a lot of times these different categories of access end up fighting with each other for resources. And then you have, uh, you know, I think a, a great example that I think about is, is uh, things like Sleep No More or, um, or, or these kind of radically immersive productions. I've, I've been to a couple of site-specific theater um, mm -hmm. productions in the Bay Area that were fantastic, but also wildly inaccessible if you had any kind of mobility issues, just yeah. not really the same experience um and so how do how do how are we making these um kind of compromises each time and i think the reality is that it is really difficult to accommodate every kind of access need at once and there needs to be this multiplicity of types of performance and that the transferability from form of access to another or from one type of disability to another are really really different projects and so there just needs to be a much higher buy-in yeah. um, about the arguments that we make and the type of theater that we make. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, that actually also leads us to our last question, I think, which is... Um, it's almost like we scaffolded these. We scaffolded these questions. So, um, but I think, what are, what are some of the things that you've been seeing in theaters that, or theaters that, uh, what have theaters done that have been useful or modeled, good models mm -hmm. um, for us to to think about and build on? Yeah. I think something that has been really exciting to see is as more theaters are casting more disabled actors, and again, not casting them just to play Richard III or something, right. um, and are, are kind of trying to find ways that disability can open up new meanings. And I've started, I'm not sure exactly how to... Uh, frame this. I've started calling it lateral translation, and I'm open to other kinds of uh, monikers that are better, if anyone knows. <laughs> um, but I, you know, for example, I saw a production of Much Ado About Nothing at Oregon Shakespeare Festival mm -hmm. several years ago now. I'm getting old. Um, but they cast uh, Reagan Linton as Don John the Bastard, and it was a really interesting choice. Um, Reagan Linton is a wheelchair user, and uh, so it really recoded this character of Don John in really surprising and unexpected ways where I think that character in the text is very, it's almost confusing. He's just kind of out to make sure everyone has a bad day. Uh, there's not a lot of kind of background information about why he's so pissed off. Yeah. Um, he's like, oh, he's very opaque. And yeah. Like, yeah. So you gotta, you gotta dig in there a little bit. Yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so he, um, in the in their production, uh, he was a Don John was a woman, obviously, and they uh, regendered the character. And so, you know, even just at that level, it made me think more about the military context. And that production was very much um, amplifying the military angle um, and thinking about that character as a woman in the military and the incidents of rape and sexual assault and domestic violence in the military as 
background for why that character may be experiencing the return to a kind of festive atmosphere really differently. And then also the use of that actor's disability as a potential interpretation, again, of this kind of lingering background of war and that Don John is not having the same experience of return that everyone else is. Um, and so I thought that they, they had already done a lot of careful work to recode that, not just as a disabled villain kind of trope, but as a robust whole character. Um, and then in addition, I think the, the idea of Don John as a bastard and how bastard is not, I think, something that we think about anymore. It's yeah. not really a cultural thing um, that we certainly that anyone that I know um, <laughs> thinks very hard about. But the, but the idea of taking that character as a stigmatized character and then trying to reimagine what in a 21st century context would be similar mm -hmm. um, and kind of taking this move of, of reframing that as something that would be legible to the audience. Um, and I think that's really fascinating. I do think just to kind of, just to kind of cover all of my bases and, and in the book, I take this up in a much more kind of nuanced way, but I, I do think that we want to be careful about not just assigning some types of disability uh, currency of utility, like, oh, I can, right. we can use this disability um, and, and kind of exploit it for able-bodied audiences to understand right. Shakespeare better. Um, but I think that there is something really fascinating about how we can create new meanings in performance. And I think that is something that is a productive space to work in. Yeah, yeah. Your, your description of that had reminded me of the 2019 Much Ado mm -hmm. that was in Shakespeare in the Park um, so with an all black cast and at the time was set in 2020. It was a 2019 production, but this is pre pandemic. So it was set in uh, 2020 and, uh -huh. um, and just really actually engaged, not so much in disability in the ways that you're talking about, but in that like legibility and relatability mm -hmm. so well. Um, and used kind of paratextual things like songs and dance to to like bridge those gaps yeah. that we see in that play. So yeah, I think um, Shakespeare in the Park is often doing like that kind of stuff too. Yeah, really well. Things. Yeah. Okay. So wait, I know we said that was our last question, but I do have one more question, yeah. which is more of a invitation to wildly speculate. Um, we're into the <laughs> uncharted zones. Um, but I am, we had been thinking of building something like a flow chart or a series of questions, um, kind of guiding questions that would help theater practitioners and scholars approach a new text when trying to navigate for issues of access and disability. Um, so without the uh, pressures of the actual flowchart, I'm wondering what are some of your questions and postulations that you use? Yeah, yeah. So um, when I'm working with like performers or theater practitioners, like one of the first things that I ask is for them to envision their audience. And I'll mm -hmm. say like, who's there? Talk to me about um, what, what you're seeing. Uh, but then my next question is who is not there? Mm -hmm. right? Who are you missing? And then why? Right. And so we start talking about who is not coming to the theater and what are things that we can do to remedy that or overcome that? So increase access. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think um, we can come up with some, and we will come up with some uh, questions too about like, okay, who's on your stage, mm -hmm. right? And so both kind of the audience angle, but then the, the actor performer, um, who are you depicting? How are you depicting them? Who is playing that part? Yeah. Why? I, I yeah. think that also something that is so interesting about that that question too is the I think that many actors start when they approach a character right with going through the text and trying to find all of the ways that other people describe them right I think that's an assignment that yeah. I've definitely given and received from mm -hmm. various teachers um, but finding those textual descriptors and then unpacking them through this kind of disability studies lens um, and then furthermore kind of 
navigating how metaphors work with disability Um, because I think that it can become so abstract so quickly and we can move really quickly away from what the actual embodied experience is and what the kind of like material realities and needs are Um, and I think that as you say kind of um, thinking through the connection between what is textually present here and what is the reality of the audience that we've built over time uh, can actually be a really productive kind of cross-pollination. Yeah, awesome. So I'm really looking forward to us collaborating and typing up and putting out, hopefully in the sundial, um, a, a piece on that. A blog post yeah. about uh, a, flow, a blog post about a flowchart about <laughs> disability and access. Awesome. Um, watch this space. <laughs>